Welcome. This video is going to take a look at the Chapter 1 quiz, and hopefully you have a copy of your quiz with you so you don't have to rely on just being able to decipher my handwriting. But question number one asked, which of the following has the least number of ions? Well, these are all ionic compounds. Remember, there's a positive ion and a negative ion in each. So in the first one, I have 1 Na+, plus, 1 OH-, minus for a total of 2 ions, 2 moles, a total of 4 moles. In the second one, my cation is NH4+, plus, my anion is Cl-, minus. so now I have two uh, total ions per formula unit, just one mole for a total of two moles. The third one, I've got Ca2+, plus, but now I have two chlorine to balance that, so I have a total of three uh, ions per mole, two moles for a total of six moles. And Al2O3 has got um, two aluminum ions, three oxygen ions, so a total of five ions per mole times one mole for five moles. So that means B, my NH4Cl, is going to have the least number of ions. So number two one, so how many molecules are in a drop of ethanol? And they tell you the mass of that drop is 2.3 times 10 to the minus third grams, give you the formula. So I need to change this to moles and then multiply by Avogadro's numbers. So, and you probably don't have to get real technical with your calculations because it's multiple choice. So 2.3 times 10 to the minus third grams, one mole, if I add that up, is 46.08, or even 46 would get you plenty close. So we're talking 4.99 times 10 to the minus fifth moles of ethanol. And if I take 5... A little cleaner for you. If I take 5 times 10 to the minus 5th moles times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules in a mole, I'm going to get 30 times 10 to the 18th. Or if you punch it into your uh, scientific calculator, you'll know that's also 3 times 10 to the 19th or letter A. Number three wants to know the approximate molar mass of magnesium sulfate hydrated with seven waters. And this is also in the practice set. So I would just estimate the magnesium around 24, sulfur at 32, four oxygen, four times 16, or I'd even just round that to 60. And then the seven water, 18.02 each, or about 140 total, seven times 20. So just for a really rough estimate, I'd come up with about 256 grams, and D, 246, is the closest to that. Number four it tells you they dissolved 1.7 grams of NaNO3 with a relative molar mass of 85. In point two, I'm sorry, decimeters cubed, I thought it was the molarity, but this is the volume, the decimeters cubed, and they want to know the molarity. So I have to take the 1.7 grams, change it into moles, Divide by the 85, and you get 0.02 moles. Divide by the 0 0.20 decimeters cubed you have, and you should come up with 0.1 moles per decimeter cubed, which matches letter B. So number five, another multiple choice. They want to know which sample has the greatest mass. So one mole of SO2, you've got 32, 07 plus 32, so roughly 64 and just one mole would remain 64. Two moles of N2O, well, nitrogen is roughly 14, and 14 is 28, plus the 16. It's going to be about 44 times the two moles. So this is about 88 grams, a little heavier. Argon is right around 40, so this is about 80. And NH3 is right around 17 times the four moles is going to put me at 68. So the question is, which one has the greatest mass? That would be B. So number six wants to know, which is both an empirical and a molecular formula? And since the empirical formula has to be the simplest ratio, it's really asking, which of these formulas can't be simplified? Well, A, I can't see a way to simplify, but B, I can divide by 5 and simplify to CH2. C, I can divide by 4 and simplify to CH2. And D, I can only divide by 2, but it still simplifies to C2H5. So only A can be both an empirical and a molecular formula. 
Number seven says you have a fixed mass of gas. So fixed mass means n remains the same. So the ideal gas is when we use that when n is moving. So there's no PV equals nRT in this equation. That's what it's telling you, is you don't need that. You can just use the combined gas law. So at a certain volume, it has a temperature. So V1 is, I'm not sure what it is. Temperature is 50. Let me go ahead and add that to my 273. So I remember it's 323 Kelvin. What temperature is required to double its volume? Okay, well, let's make this x, and then V2 becomes 2x. And T2, then, is what I want to know if the pressure is kept constant. So of the combined gas law, I really just need V1 over T1 equal to V2 over T2. Well, I can plug in x over 323 equals 2x over, we'll call that y or t, whichever you want. And now when you cross multiply, 2x, 323 equals xy, get rid of the x, and I see I'm left with a temperature of 646 Kelvin is the temperature I'm looking for, and that matches D on my choices. So number nine wants to know, how many grams of H2 can you produce from three moles of Al? And they give you the balanced equation. So I can go ahead and convert my three moles of Al. I see that I get three moles of H2 per two moles of Al. So it's about nine halves or four and a half moles of H2. And at 202 grams per mole, this is right around nine grams, or that fits with letter D. Number 10 is also fairly quick. You have a relative molar mass or molecular mass of 56 for a gas with an empirical formula of CH2. So what's the molecular formula? Well, CH2 would weigh 14. Compared to the 56, 56 is three times more, so that means I have to multiply this by three, and I should expect a molecular formula of C3. I'm sorry, that's four times more. Getting late in the day here. This is four times more, so this becomes C4H8, which matches letter D as well. From this test bank, what I'd say is if you're not sure, D, there seems to be a lot of Ds. But let's go ahead and look at number 11. Number 11 is a fairly straightforward um, empirical formula. Talks about smog, component is pan, and it's got 20.2% carbon. It's got 11.4% nitrogen, 65.9% oxygen, and 2.5% hydrogen. So I can think of each of these percents as being the grams out of 100 and go ahead and convert to molar amounts. So my carbon I'm coming up with 1.68 moles. My nitrogen I'm coming up with 0.814 moles. My oxygen, I'm going to get a little over 4, 4.12 moles. And my hydrogen is going to be 2.48. So dividing by my smallest ratio, my smallest amount, my smallest molar amount, I should say, 0.814, uh, according to sig figs, these come out to 2 one, five, and three. So my empirical formula is C2 and one O5 H3. Number 12 gives you two really uh, complicated looking equations there. And really the only thing you need from those equations is the heat release, the kilojoules per mole. So Read the information and don't get too wigged out, but you've got 10% ethanol and 90% octane, and identified, I identified the ethanol and the octane for you, the octane being the C8H18, the ethanol being C2H5OH, they wrote it slightly different on your quiz. 
But they tell you you have one kilogram, so 12A, part I, they want to know in one kilogram of fuel, what's the mass in grams of ethanol and then B, uh, oh, and octane, both. So one kilogram is really just 1,000 grams. So then my ethanol is going to be 10% times that 1,000 or 100 grams. And my octane is going to be the 90% times 1,000 or 900 grams. And that adds back up to 1,000, so that's good. And then part two of that, they want to know how many moles that is. Well, the 100 grams of ethanol has a molar mass of 46.08. So that's 2.17 moles of ethanol. And then the 900 grams of octane has a molar mass of 114.20. So this is 7.88 moles. So part three on the next page, I'm going to squeeze it in here because I can, wants to know what's the total energy released. Well, I've got 2.17 moles of ethanol, and I see according to my equation that 1367 kilojoules per mole is released, so I can just multiply these, and I can do the same thing with my octane, the 7.88 moles, times its energy release of 5470 kilojoules per mole, the middle minus one there. So I come up with the energy released by each um, fuel source, 2966.4 and 43,103 for a total of 46,700 kilojoules. And then part B wants to know if it were vaporized, and apparently this um, confused a few people, but all it means is if the fuel uh, was changed from liquid to be in a gas, would that increase or decrease the amount of energy released? And it actually does increase the energy because there's no intermolecular forces to be overcome. So think of it like friction. You don't have this friction to overcome so the energy uh, can be released more efficiently.